Hello and welcome again to Terrain Gospel Ministries, to the gathering place. I apologize for not uh, putting any videos out for a couple of weeks again. Uh, it's been a busy time. I, um, I'm putting this one out. It's entitled, Without Holiness, with a question mark. Without Holiness. And the main scripture for this is, Pursue peace with all people and holiness. And the sanctification is what some um, other translations say without which no one will see the Lord. That's pretty clear to me. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. As a Christian, pursue holiness. Live holy in our lives, without which no one will see the Lord. And um, this has been in the works for a while in my heart stirring around. Uh, because a little while ago, we, we uh, received an email from a sister in the Lord. We've never met her or anything, but uh, she was... Uh, going across a, a church website, I guess, and um, had attended this church and all. And the pastor at this church uh, uh, preached a rather peculiar message. And she just uh, seemed to, she tried to uh, talk to the pastor uh, and, and with no, no avail about it. He just seemed to kind of put her off. Uh, she went to the website, I guess, and, and found, I had preached there a, a while back. And uh, she found us, assumed we were still there, uh, and, and contacted us about it and wrote a rather long letter and explained it. And she sent the link to us about this particular uh, message that he preached. Uh, it's from Romans 14. I will attempt to, I'm not good at this, but I will attempt to uh, uh, paste the link or somehow to this message that you can hear it for yourselves. If I can't, when I go to post this message, would someone please contact me uh, and tell me how to do it so I can? I think I know, but if, I, if it's not there, when you get this, help me out and someone contact me and do that. Um, the message that he preached about, we don't attend that church anymore, and we've had dealings with this pastor in the past just to try to say, hey, brother, you are going in the wrong direction here with other things. What he seems to do, he likes to preach exponentially, which is not a bad thing at all. I do it myself. However, uh, when you get to points that you don't quite understand, and then he just tends to kind of make it up as he goes, uh, and then when it gets into a mass, he just pulls the whole love blanket over the whole mess and says, well, God just loves us. And we just have to all get along. Uh, this is what he did here, and you can see it in this as you as you uh, do it. And before I start, you know, inevitably someone's going to think that this is just trashing this pastor. Uh, that's not the intent of this message at all. The intent of this message that I'm putting out here is to help people who may have been misled in this direction, who may think it's okay to assume a life and do things to satisfy our flesh and not live a holy night life. They should consider Hebrews 12. So there are sheep out there. There are Christians out there that have been caught up in this whole thing. And there's lots of false teachers out there like this man that just seems to kind of let it all go. And you'll see it yourself in this. So that's what the purpose of this is to correct. Inevitably, I'm sure I'll get some mail about it to say that uh, people aren't happy with what I'm doing. That's entirely up to them. He preaches from Romans 14 and 1. And the, the scripture is, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. He calls those disputable matters. I'll just give a little brief run-up of what he talks about, and then we'll discuss it. Disputable matters are non-essential issues. Non-biblical essential issues is what he says. And, you know, we will have a difference of opinion or conviction about certain things in the Bible. And his basic statement was, it was there, you know, as he started this deal, he said he wanted to have a Bible study without drama. And he says, well, it looks like we're not going to be able to do that. So we need to know how to handle ourselves when those differences are present. And then he went on to name a bunch of things that were brought up in his church. You'll see it in the video, uh, hopefully. But uh, if not, here's the list. Uh, here we go. Uh, so these are things, these non-essential issues, these disputable matters, what he calls them disputable matters, that he has uh, people in his church or his peers, etc., etc., uh, tell him, you know, about, and he doesn't want to discuss these, quite frankly. Uh, tobacco use, here we go. Drinking alcohol. These are Christians that are bringing up things to him as the pastor about these issues, okay? T tobacco use, <coughs> excuse me, drinking alcohol, Netflix, watching R-rated movies, 
the casino, hockey pool, mixed bathing, Facebook, coffee, politics, COVID, unrestricted internet, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, circumcision, tithing, secular music, clothing styles, Bible translations, contraceptives, a certain sexual intercourse position, yes, that's right, yoga, acupuncture, chiropractor, daily devotions, women's role in ministry, recycling, composting, head coverings, homeschooling, and Harry Potter. Rather interesting list from the pulpit. However, uh, and there's a few more that as I read this, uh, his description for his video, there's a few other ones, including these that were listed in there, and didn't, he just didn't mention them, vaccines, getting tattoos, and cannabis. And he used some scriptures here as he kind of defended his position. And he said, you know, it quoted a scripture very strangely out of Hebrews 12 and 6. And he says, look at God does the disciplining and the correction. That position's filled by God. So you or I don't have to do any correcting or any disciplining. Philippians 1 and 6. Very strangely, he says, he who started a good work in you will complete it. I'm not quite sure where he comes up with this, that conclusion, but just we don't have to worry about anybody who is drinking alcohol, cannabis, watching R-rated movies, no problem. God started a good work in them. He will complete it at the end, even though they're going down a very unholy road and contrary to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, where it says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. But we're not going to mention that to them. We don't want to have a drama in our Bible studies, or our preaching from the church. He calls them Bible studies. He doesn't preach. And he said, we don't want to do that, because God is going to look after that. Romans 14 and 4, the question is asked, who are you to judge? And then he goes on to defend his position again. He says, God is the judge. That position is filled. It's not my job. That's what he stated as a pastor. And I would question that as the pastor. Contrary to what Paul writes to Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he says, Timothy, preach the word, correct, confront, encourage with patience and instruction. So how do you get away from if you're a pastor and you don't want to confront these issues, disputable or not, but are rather unholy for a Christian to demonstrate Christ than be an ambassador for Christ with a cigar in his hand, watching a, a drink and a beer and watching an R-rated movie, and you're not willing to confront that as a pastor, I think you should step away from the pulpit. He goes on to say that he says, if you are judging disputable matters, you are sinning. That's what he says. You can see it in his video. You are sinning. And he says, so stop it now, rather smugly. Really. You're sinning if you're judging these disputable matters. If you're not trying to correct a younger, weaker person in the faith about these disputable matters, you're sinning. Actually, you're sinning by doing these disputable matters. In fact, you're not going to see the Lord, according to Hebrews 12, 14. And I quite frankly think you're being disobedient to the instruction of the Lord in 2 Timothy to say you are supposed to correct and confront these issues. Not to stop it. I think he forgets that with this liberty that we have in Christ, 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, all things are lawful to me. We're going to see this later. But I think he's forgetting to read on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 and 12, it says, Take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who has knowledge, and you should as a pastor, doing these disputable things, will he not be encouraged to do them as well? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus you are sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. And as well, you sin against Christ. And we're going to see some of these practices that he actually does, that he boasts about, that says he has freedom in these things. And you can hear it all in his video. To further demonstrate his maturity, or lack of, I might have to say, he said that in conversation in his house, he brought up the name Justin Trudeau and his wife, the pastor's wife, turns around, who she's very much a musician or a singer or very much into music. She turns around and says, there's only one Justin that we discuss in this house. 
That's Justin Bieber. And he said it and had a big laugh about it from the pulpit. And then he talks about the secular music. He says, we just have a lot more freedom in our family when it comes to music, really. Romans 14 and 8 also should be a warning to him. He says, don't tear down God's work because of selfishness. Don't cause your brother to stumble. He should read that. Don't tear down God's work because of your selfishness. Because you think you have freedom in something, and your weak brother or sister is seeing you do it, they're being led away, just as what we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9 to 12. And he goes on to tell this very interesting story about him being invited to a hot tub. It's in the wintertime. He thought that was pretty cool, a bunch of his buddies. And you sit in the hot tub and watch the snowfall. It's kind of neat, actually. And then just as he's getting to the hot tub and he's climbing the ladder to step into the hot tub, he's got his uh, swim shorts on, and, and he says, take the picture. And they said, you know, why? And he says, well, what a great to picture to take of a pastor. He had a wine glass full of San Pellegrino, which is basically just sparkling water, and a lit cigar in the other hand. He said, take the picture. And then he just says, I have freedom in these things. I have freedom in these things. And then the next sentence he says is, at the same time, I don't want to exercise my freedom in a way that causes my brother or sister to stumble. And then he goes on to tell a story, a rather sad one, that while he was back in Florida, before he came here, he used to get together with his buddies and they would all smoke cigars. These were Christians. This is not before he was saved. This was after he was saved, after he decided to be a pastor and come here and pastor a church of young people. They used to get together and they used to smoke cigars. And he says, the reason? And he gives the reason. Generally, our wives would leave us alone because of the smell. So much for loving your wives, honoring your wives. Uh, but anyway, uh, and he says, and we could talk then about all kinds of things. And what we like to talk about was theology, God's word, God, his word, and, and you know, life. And then he mentioned a friend of his, Ben, I think his name was, and he says, this guy also smoked cigarettes, but he used to get there and smoke cigars with him and all of that stuff. But unfortunately, he inhaled a lot of this stuff and uh, he got lung cancer and he died in his 30s. Very tragic. I'm not making fun of this. And then his statement was, I wish I wouldn't have made him stumble. That's kind of funny that although he did this and all this guy died and all he did this years ago, even just months ago, or back in the wintertime perhaps, he's doing the same thing, smoking a cigar with his buddies in a hot tub. I wonder. And then he goes on as he kind of sums the thing up. He's talking about lots of rules or no rules at all. You know, lots of Christians, they like lots of rules. None of them like... They, they, they don't have any rules at all, but he says it's not about rules, it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I know lots of people who have, you know, all kinds of rules, but they have no joy. And I know lots of people who have all kinds of rules, and they do have joy. And people who have no rules with no joy, and he said, so, you know, but it's all about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then he wraps it up when he says this. And he just looks right at the camera. It's, it's, it's sad. This is what kind of prompted all of this when I saw it was he ends with this. The person who is weak in the faith and has all the rules, you need to grow up. And he said that smugly and the camera dropped and you can watch it in the video. And all I can say to him and anyone who chooses to do this is my own quote. I just pride masquerading as maturity is but selfish disobedience to follow the Spirit and choose holiness. Pride masquerading as maturity is but selfish disobedience to follow the Spirit and choose holiness. Vance Havner, a wonderful preacher of yesteryear, I've listened to as much as I could find of his. He stated this, he says, When the people of God, especially the pastors and the leaders, are a dirty gray, the black sheep and the world feel a whole lot more comfortable. When the people of God, especially the pastors and the leaders, are dirty gray, the black sheep, the rest of the people in the church, and the world feels a whole lot more comfortable. Maybe this pastor should read on to Romans 14.22. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So let's just look at the list here. I just kind of picked some of those things out of the list, some of the main ones about that absurd list that he wrote out here that he stated. 
And we'll just look at a few of them and just look at some scriptures that would, I would say, refute some of his positions on this. The one is tattoos, getting tattoos. People get tattoos, people get born again with tattoos. You don't get them just, they don't erase because you got saved. No more than an earring or a piercing gets erased, none of that stuff. But as a Christian, we should live differently than the world, and that should be the end of our tattoo getting. You don't need a cross tattooed on your arm or an angel or something to say you're a Christian. Holy living, your love for one another, righteousness, should indicate you're a Christian or not. A changed life from what it was before you were saved. That's an indication of being a Christian. The Old Testament prohibited tattoos because it was a pagan practice. It was filled with idolatry and superstition. Why? Because the pagans marked their skin with the name of their god or a symbol honoring an idol. So why would a Christian want to do that? Leviticus 19 and 28, God spoke to his people and he said, no tattoo, don't, don't put any tattoo marks on you. Don't tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord your God. Pretty simple. Clothing styles. That was one of the items that was addressed. First Timothy says, also the women who are to dress themselves, First Timothy 2, 9 and 10, also the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency and good sense. Not with elaborate hairstyles, gold pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works, as it is proper for women, excuse me, who profess to worship God. We shouldn't dress like the world when it comes to being revealing or provocative or causing your brother to stumble. If you're a, if you're a, if you're a if you're a, a a Christian woman, you should dress moderately. Not to have the attraction of other men in your church or whatever to be attracted to you because of your unmodest apparel. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says, You were bought with a price. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your life is not your own. To wear or do what you want, you've been bought with a price. We become slaves to Jesus rather than slaves to the sin we were once slaves to. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in your body. Tattoos, glorify God in your body. Clothing styles, glorify God in your body. Men the same. Men don't have to wear something that's provocative or attractive to women. You have a wife, you dress for her. You have a husband, you dress for him. Let's look at this uh, next one of tobacco use. Drinking alcohol, cannabis consumption. Uh, my wife Lorraine was at a, uh, she was invited to a, uh, I think it was a bridal shower uh, a while back. And at this bridal shower, uh, uh, there was several members of that church. And she knew many of the, the, the girls that were there, invited by a friend of ours. And uh, it was a... Uh, uh, a bridal shower, I believe, and there was also a pampered chef presentation there. It's at Kitchen Stuff. And the guy who presented the pastors, the pampered chef, was an elder in, an elder, or a, a, a deacon, elder, board of director guy in the church, young guy and all. And he, he preaches and things like that at times, but he was on the board, maybe is or isn't now, I don't know. And uh, in this, and they were, you know, all going on, they were doing all of their pampered chef presentation, all this stuff. And then it came around to talking about wine. And Lorraine was stunned because most everybody there, all the members of that church, they all went off about their, their favorite wine and how they just love their wine and how they glorified their wine. Christian. Wasn't much talking about Jesus or anything else that was holy. Not that it was overly coarse, but just she was rather shocked that these guys then just all turned and focused and talked all about their favorite wine and how they liked it and how it went with all of the food and, and all of that. But she just thought that was odd. I do too. 2 Corinthians 5 and 20 says you're an ambassador for Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 
like tobacco use, smoking. It's addictive. I smoked, I know. Cannabis. Whether it's recreational or whether it's medicinal, all the point is, is like, you can be brought under the power of that. You realize that the word for witchcraft is the Greek word pharmakeia. The Greek word for witchcraft is pharmakeia. And from that word, we get the word pharmacy. And from that word, obviously, we get our drugs. And being careful here about not being under the control of that. So why would you want to as a Christian, unless it's absolutely medicinal, that's what Paul told Timothy, do you have a little wine with you, with you? because you're, you're often infirmities. But he said, Paul didn't drink or have a beer while he watched the game. I don't think he did. Unholy. 1 Corinthians 10.31, we'll just sum this up. Therefore, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Glorify your wine. Are you glorifying it? Are you doing it for the glory of God? Are you having your wine? Are you having your drinking your alcohol, or smoking your cigarette or your cigar? Are you doing that to the glory of God or are you just satisfying your own fleshly desires? Here's a few more. R-rated movies. R-rated movies. The R is for restricted. R-rated movies are filled with pornography, violence, vulgarity, all the lusts of the eyes and all the lusts of the flesh. Here's a few scriptures. Leviticus 21 and 6 says, They shall be holy to their God. These are talking about the people. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of the Lord. Yet these movies are filled with profanity. Is it okay to watch them as a Christian? This pastor doesn't want to discuss that issue. Filled with pornography. Sex scenes. Well, it was only one. What does it matter? It was only one. Ephesians 5, 3 and 4 but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place. That's why we shouldn't watch this stuff. Job 31, he says, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Jesus said, even if you look upon that and have those lustful thoughts, it's the same as committing fornication or adultery with that woman. 1 Thessalonians says, chapter 3 says, to, to how to, you need to know how to control your body. Know how to control your own body in holiness and honor. Not watch some filthy television program. Luke 11 your eyes light up your inward being. Luke eleven thirty four. 34. Your eyes light up your inward being. A pure eye lets sunshine into your soul. A lustful eye shuts out the light and plunges you into darkness. Why would that pastor not want to talk, talk about this and discuss this with young, weak Christians? Well, we're above that. We've got liberty in the Lord. We're fine. God will work it out in the end. He might, but it may not be that good. Romans 6, 12 and 19. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, which we once were, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for just as you once presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, doing those things of the world that we were saved from, leading to more unlawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, as slaves of righteousness, and here's the word, for holiness. Holiness is important. Hebrews 12, you're not going to see God without holiness. So it says, now present your members as slaves, present your bodies as slaves of righteousness, to do righteousness for holiness. I think holiness is important. Netflix, secular music, secular movies, the whole social media world, not just watching a television or listening to a CD. Do we still do that anymore? 
Netflix, this is what was mentioned in his list. Psalm 119 is kind of clear. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless th things. We are slaves to the social media world these days. Turn away my, my eyes from looking at worthless things. These are not necessarily, necessarily pornograph pornographic. They're just... Why? 1 John 2, 15, 16. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. All of this stuff that we entertain ourselves with, that we go, oh, I have liberty in these things. They're not of God. They're not from God. They're of the world. And we've been saved out of the world. He says... Well, let's just read it. James 4 and 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. That's how he addresses these people who do this. Are you an adulterer or an adulteress? If you're doing and back in bed with the things of the world that you've been saved out of, you're an adulterer or an adulteress with God. Against God. You're married to Him. You want to entertain and get into bed again with the world and the things of the world. James calls us adulterers. God calls us adulterers and adulteresses in the book of James. He says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Let's talk about yoga. When I preached there, I preached about dying to self. It wasn't very popular, but I preached about dying to self. And I have other videos that you can go back on the YouTube channel and find out. And it ended up expanded into about five or six versions. Uh, that Not versions, five or six. Uh, uh, it branched into five or six more messages out of that about dying to self, the various aspects. But I brought up yoga. And I had several shocked faces in the congregation when I brought up yoga and saying, why do we do yoga? It's Hindu. It's not Christian. Well, it's just exercising. It's just stretching. It's Hindu. And one thing I did do, and I said, okay, well, okay, 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 okay. It's Christian. You can put on Christian music. You can do yoga and stretching to your Christian music. Why is it called yoga? Is it Hindu or is it Christian? And I explained it this way for those that maybe have never heard this before. You know, I can get my Betty Crocker cake mix. I can't bake it. But I can buy But I can get my Betty Crocker cake mix. Mix it all up. It's a Betty Crocker chocolate cake mix. So I mix it up, get this chocolate looking cake, and I cover it with chocolate icing, and I slice it, and I serve it to you and say, here's a piece of chocolate cake. Great. Okay. I can take that same cake. Another one, and I can cover it with vanilla icing. Take a nice slice, nice dark black cake, white icing, hand it to you and say, here's a piece of vanilla cake. What would you say? No, it's chocolate cake. Why? The inside's chocolate. Make a carrot cake, cover it with peanut butter icing. Here you go, here's a peanut butter cake. No, it's a carrot cake because the inside is carrot. The outside is the icing. Yoga, I don't care what kind of music you play to it, inside is Hindu. Take a Hindu cake, cover it with Christian icing. Here's a slice of Christian cake. No, Hindu cake. Yoga is Hindu. Yoga means union, by the way. Union. And it's meant to... Unite one's inner self with Brahman, their highest spiritual dude, to develop a deep knowledge of self. It teaches that we have everything we need within ourselves, that we ourselves are God. We don't really need God Almighty. We ourselves are God. We can have this inner understanding, deeper understanding. Isaiah 2 and 6, the warning is, my people are filled with Eastern ways, that's where it came from, and are pleased with the children of foreigners. As I mentioned, there's this holy Christian yoga, Yahweh yoga, they call it, blasphemy. Yahweh yoga, it's performed in churches and all of that stuff. And Christians are flocking to it because it's such good exercise, I guess. 
It makes the mind and body stronger, this is what they say, the mind and body stronger and more flexible so that we become more authentic people, able to hear God and experience Him in previously impossible ways. If that is the case, truly the case, why didn't Jesus teach yoga? Why is God warned all down through time, stay away from the Eastern mystical practices? You know, I think the Holy Spirit is able to enable you to hear God and have a better understanding of Him. We need yoga for these previously impossible ways? No. But we are flocking to that. It's Hindu. It's leading us away. It's darkness from what we've been delivered out of. And I could go on and on about what it is. Look it up what it is. It's inner serpentine serpent power that they want to unlock through these chakras. That all doesn't sound very Christian or holy to me. So why would you want to do it? One more. Harry Potter. In his little story that this pastor told, he told a story about uh, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, as we know, is that by J.K. Rowling's and he's the little magician guy practices all this witchcraft and sorcery and magic and all of that stuff. Very popular books. Very popular books. And everyone flock to this because they say that, well, they... Uh, uh, the kids are reading at least. It's a good enough reason, I guess, right? Your Christian kids are learning about this. This guy goes on to talk about in his... Uh, in his uh, story, this pastor, and you'll see it in the video there, about him uh, driving kids to hockey and all that stuff, listening to secular music. One of the kids of another Christian man uh, is in the car, and he tells him that, and he's like, hey, pastor, what about this secular music? Da, 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 da. So he says, well, we have much more freedom in this music, etc., etc., as you heard before, and all of that stuff. And the pastor, th this Christian guy questioned this pastor and says, well, uh, let me see here. You've got all this freedom of music, but you won't let your kids read Harry Potter. And he's like, uh, well, uh, gee, I never thought of it that way. And then he went on to have this all explained to him. And at the end, he's like, yeah, you know, he convinced me. That's true. I probably shouldn't be so restrictive in all of this area. So now he said his son, I don't know how old he was at the time, was overjoyed that now he could start reading Harry Potter. Seriously. And I would say that with a question mark, Pastor. Seriously. Let's learn a little bit about Harry Potter. Let's, hear what the, let's see what the Bible says. And uh, let's learn a little bit about it. I don't have that book with me here now, but I have a very good friend, Eric Barger, and he wrote a book, Entertaining Spirits Unawares. I think it's a 2011 edition. If you can find it, get it. Eric Barger, Entertaining Spirits Unawares. And he's looked for years into the whole occult world and see how it is dragging us all away and our children away. Here's what the Bible says. First of all, I'm sorry, Harry Potter's books, and it's full of witchcraft and wizardry. It's this stereotypical white and black magic, and it's spelled with a K on the end. That's what the magic world calls it. And, and, and it, the Bible clearly condemns this kind of stuff. Deuteronomy 18, the main scripture, Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 11, There shall not be found among you anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interpret omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. And a lot of this stuff primarily is in the books of Harry Potter. Good reading material for our kids. Not. Entertaining Spirits Unawares, I'm sorry, yeah, by this book, uh, Eric Barger and David Benoit was a co-author with him. And I just uh, uh, have a, a few pages I want to just read from that book, some points off those pages. If you have the book, get the book, 230, page 230 to 232. And uh, uh, Eric writes in this, three points to argue against Harry Potter. He says, one, how can a Christian ever portray witchcraft in a positive light? Just think about that. How can a Christian ever say that witchcraft is good in a positive light? There's, there's this God, Satan, always a, 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 against this each other type thing. There's always light versus darkness, good versus evil. How can we portray that in good light, he says. And in Ephesians 5.11 is a scripture. Take no part 
in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. You can't go along with them. How can you have a Christian say, yeah, he's great reading, he's reading Harry Potter, he's learning all about witchcraft and magic and all that stuff. Great. And he loves the books. The storyline also includes a decidedly anti-parent, anti-authority overtone. It teaches these kids to be rebellious against your parents, rebellious against authority. All these little characters in the Harry Potter books do exactly that. They're rebellious against, like most kids' TV today teach them to be rebellious against Christians. And the cesspool of the schools that we send our kids to now are teaching them that as well. You don't listen to, the, you don't listen to your parents, you listen to us. We'll tell you, unfortunately. But the storyline in these Harry Potter books does the same thing. Very anti-parent teaching and very anti-authority overtone. And yet Colossians 3.20 says this, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children, if you want to be pleasing to the Lord, obey your parents. It goes better for you if you do. And the other thing here is uh, what he writes in, this, in his uh, book here, Eric writes in his book, is a question of morality. He says the heroes are found, the heroes of the book, all of these characters and these heroes in the Harry Potter books are found lying, being dishonest, carrying out revenge, espousing hatred, swearing, underage drinking, and other foul personal attributes. That's what these heroes are doing. So how can this be good reading for Christian kids? A good um, um, uh, uh, peer, a good, uh, 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 um, lost the word. How can this be good reading for Christian kids? How can this be good training for them? And how can Bible-believing parents and pastors be okay with this? How? As a Bible-believing Christian, you read your Bible and you let your kid read witchcraft. And you think that's okay. Maybe you don't read your Bible. Maybe that's the problem. He goes on to say this. He says, At best, children will be confused and desensitized about God's warning about the occult. And at worst, they'll become enchanted and encouraged by the magic and the unchristlike attitude the characters display. You'll ruin your kids. He writes this in page 232, and he tells a little story here. It's an account. Eric writes, Some time ago, a young mother sought me out and then accosted me before a service one evening in the foyer of a church outside Pittsburgh. Without any introduction, the lady announced in no uncertain terms that I was completely wrong about Harry Potter. She ranted, You are the one who's come to stop our kids from reading. Period. Exclamation mark. My daughter has read all the Harry Potter books at least twice. There is nothing wrong with them. We go to church. We're Christians. Eric writes, as I backed away from her barrage, I said, ma'am, ma'am, you haven't even heard what I'm going to say yet. Your daughter has told you that Harry and his friends, no, no, has your daughter told you, forgive me, has your daughter, he asked this woman, has your daughter told you that Harry and his friends lie, cheat, steal, and swear in the books she's reading? The woman appeared stunned. And looking down at her 10-year-old daughter, she nearly gasped as she asked, Is that true? Eric writes, he says, I felt sorry for the little girl when she teared up and whimpered. But mom, it's not on every page. Eric goes on to write here, This mother had purchased these books for her daughter and was probably thrilled to see her daughter actually reading as opposed to just watching TV or spending hours on these things. She may have been repulsed that someone with my stance might undermine her parental authority and judgment. And it appears that this pastor that I just mentioned, why this video is here, he doesn't want to undermine the parent's authority. He doesn't want to tell them this is wrong for your kids to do. He'd rather see them slide off the edge. I don't see what's good about that at all. She may have been repulsed by, with someone with my stance, that someone with my stance might undetermine her parental authority and judgment. Regardless, the point remains that she was ignorantly defending her daughter's infatuation with Harry Potter. She didn't indicate that she had any understanding of what the scriptures say about witchcraft and the occult. Eric says, I said to her after reading the Potter novels multiple times, your daughter is probably very knowledgeable of the storyline. She knows all about Harry Potter, but 
Although you have announced to me that you are Christians, it is fairly obvious that you know little or nothing about what the Bible states on the issue of witchcraft. Quote. And he writes, he says, that's really the point. So many people will argue in favor of stuff like Harry Potter, but without having a clear understanding of what they are in favor of or what the Bible dictates. I fear this is the condition of so many people inside the church in our day, especially concerning issues like the occult. It all comes back to our decision to first study the scriptures and then follow them. Here's a little warning from James 1.22. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, otherwise deceiving yourselves. Study the word, find out what the Bible says, find out what God says, because he's the ultimate judge in these things, and do what you read in the Bible. Do what he instructs you to do, otherwise you'll deceive yourself. And I wonder how we can willingly promote Harry Potter and allow our children to ex be exposed to witchcraft and even sleep at night as a pastor or a Christian parent. I don't know how you can do yoga knowing that it's yoga and still think that's okay with, with God. Matthew 6, 18 and 6. And here's a, here's a warning. Here's a strong scripture that should make us sit up and take notice. When we were willingly exposing our children to witchcraft, willingly allowing our children to watch pornography, not telling them that it's wrong, willingly allowing our children to do those things, but especially Harry Potter and witchcraft being drawn away into the whole occult. Jesus gives a warning. Jesus gives a warning. In Matthew 18 and 6, he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. It would be better to have a big stone chained to your neck and thrown overboard and have been drowned in the sea than to cause the little ones to fall away by telling them, Hey, it's okay if you do this. It'll all work out in the end. You'll be fine. I don't think anyone, including that pastor, can hold his breath that long. I just want to close and wrap up with this with just a bunch more scriptures, if you don't mind. Why do you think we can casually live without holiness before a holy God? What do you think he died on the cross to do? What do you think he washed us clean of our sins for? To just go back into the world? I got liberty with this. Take one verse out of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful to me. Stop and just live my life selfishly and foolishly and unholy before a holy God? Why do you think we can do that? God demands us to be different, to be separate and to be holy. Scriptures tell us that. Leviticus 20 and 7, Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy, for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1, 16, For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 16 over to 7 and 1. It says, But what agreement has the temple of God with idols? We are the temple of God, by the way. Inside us is not a building, not with a cross on the roof, not anymore. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols, with witchcraft, with the occult, with the world? with our selfishness and our flesh. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are a temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Another scripture says, therefore having, or 7 and 1, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Titus 2.12 instructs us, deny godliness, New Testament, deny godliness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous and godly way in the present age. Other translations say, uh, sober, sober, righteous, and godly. You know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the falling away. 
in these end days, the church will fall away. They'll, they'll call evil good and good evil. They'll call stuff that God calls unholy and say, it's okay. Then God understands. We're good. It says it's going to happen. And it says what's going to happen is that it's going to fall away just before the Antichrist comes. And we are falling away now at a rapid rate. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, People will not endure sound doctrine anymore. They will not want this thing. The Holy Bible. They want their own ideas, satisfy their own flesh. Just have a little enough Christianity to think they're okay, but walk as close to the world or partly into the world and think they can get away with it. They use God as a grace dispensing machine. That's not what he is. He loves and he's graceful and merciful every day, but that's not what he should be used for. He should be honored and glorified for what he's done for us and delivered us from that. Instead, we use him for something totally different. 2 Peter 2 talks about false teaching that comes along. False teaching, false teachers that instruct their flock that it's okay. I get liberty over this. You're fine. We shouldn't confront this. If you're doing that, it's sin. Don't judge. God's going to judge anyway. Yes, God is going to judge. And he may well judge us and you as a Christian. Some people think they're Christians and they're going to show up in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23 and say, Hey, Lord, have we not done all these great things in your name? Have we not done this, 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 and this? Look at us. And he's going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Frightening scripture. Matthew 25, he talks about the ten virgins. Five were ready and five were foolish. Five did not have any oil in their vessels, filling their lamps. Five were not living holy. Five were sleeping. They're like, oh, well, of time when he comes, it'll be okay. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're smoking cigars and listening to Justin Bieber. Maybe. But they didn't go. Because the Lord came and took the ones that were ready earnestly looking for him, Titus 2.12, earnestly looking for him, not playing around with the world, not satisfying their desires and their flesh, earnestly looking, holy, living. And it says a bridegroom came and opened the door and brought them in, five of them, and closed the door. The other 10 got back, okay, we're ready now, we're all cleaned up, we're good, got the cigar out, we're good. And he said, they beat on the door, he spoke to them through the door, he didn't even open it. He says, I don't know you, go away. Read about it, Matthew 25. That's happening now. And the rapture is just about to happen. And I think we should be considering holiness, not Netflix. Jeremiah 7 and 8 reads this, and this is in the uh, New American Standard Bible, the 1995 edition. He says, Behold, Jeremiah 7, 8 to 11. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that you may do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. Now, I'm not writing my own Bible translation here, but I, I'm going to give you the Terrain Gospel Ministries, Pastor Terry version of what I just read. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words which will not help you in the end. As my people, will you continue to behave like the world does by wearing unmodest, revealing clothing and marking your body with tattoos? Will you continue to watch R-rated movies filled with pornography, violence, and foul language where people are cursing and taking my name in vain? Why would you be entertained with all the secular movies or music that does not honor or glorify me? Will you still take tobacco and cannabis and alcohol into your body as if it doesn't matter and then glorify your favorite wine like the world does? Will you engage in yoga knowing it is Hindu and yet argue and insist it is only stretching and exercise? Will you promote the abominations of the occult in the form of Harry Potter and allow them into the precious lives of your children and call it good reading material? And then you have the nerve to come and stand before me, God, and say, we are delivered and we have freedom to do all these things, even though you know they are of the world and unholy and are what I delivered you from. Has the people 
which claim to be mine become a people of unholiness? Behold, declares the Lord, the Almighty, the Holy One, behold, I see all of this you are doing. Galatians 5.13 says this, Brothers and sisters, God has called you to freedom. Hear the call and do not spoil this gift by using your liberty to engage in what your flesh desires. Instead, use it to serve each other as Jesus taught through love. Titus 1.7-9 I'm going long here, I'm sorry. For an overseer, which is a pastor, a bishop, an overseer, as God's administrator, must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. A pastor is supposed to refute those things which are disputable matters and keep the sheep on the right path, keep himself from being a dirty gray. A white sheep is in much greater contrast to a black one than a dirty gray sheep is. Here's another warning from the Bible, Hebrews 10, 29. Think how much worse will be the punishment deserved by someone who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has treated as something common the blood of the covenant, which made him holy. That's what the blood did. It made you holy. Why do we want to live in unholiness because of that? Think how much worse the punishment <clears throat> deserved by someone who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, excuse me, who has treated as something common the blood of the covenant, which made him holy, and who has insulted the Spirit, the giver of God's grace. I seriously think that is something to think about. And another little quote. I believe I heard this from Adrian Rogers, but I cannot remember. But it says, Deliberate choices determines one unalterable fate. If we're making deliberate choices now to turn away from these things, take our liberty because we can. I'm above that. I've got freedom in those. Take one scripture and make a life of unholiness about it from it. Then we want to go to God and lift our hands and worship God and sing our hymns and all of our lovely worship music and do our sacrifices and all of that stuff. If you read Isaiah 58, God says, that stinks to me. I'd rather have you holy. For obedience is better than sacrifices. 1 Samuel 15, 22. And I can't see any other way of doing this and living for God than being obedient to Him because our life is not our own. If you're doing this today, I... I, I pray that you would turn away. If you're still in this church, and I hope many in that church still will see this video, send it to them. I'm not trying to trash your pastor. I'm trying to help them. I'm trying to help you to stay on the right path and turn away from that darkness you're sliding into and live holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. God bless you.